Welcome to the We Are Libertarians Book Club. I am Hody Johns, and I'm here with Hadley. How's it going, buddy? Pretty good, Hody. How are you? Doing awesome, man. Doing awesome. Uh, it's just you and me today, it looks like. We may get some joiners later. Uh, but I am totally okay with that, because we got to talk about Catcher in the Rye. And anytime we talk about classic literature, I, I waffled between majoring in theology or English, uh, and, and specifically literature, and, uh, and I opted to go with theology, but I took a bunch of courses on, on classic literature before then, and I could talk forever about it. But classic in the, uh, Catcher in the Rye is a <laughs> classic uh, and, and really uh, an enjoyable read. I think a lot of times uh, classic literature, they do such a good job with the artistry that you're like, well, that's, it's very artistic. I see how it was hard to do and it was complex, but it really wasn't fun. Whereas I think class, Catcher in the Rye is just so fun. Even if you, I mean, there's symbolism on every single page. I mean, you flip any page, you'd be like, there's symbolism going on. Even if you miss every single symbolic point, you're still going to have an enjoyable read. Yeah. I, I don't know. Did you have fun reading it? Oh, I did. Absolutely. And as I alluded before we even came on, I did just finalize it today. But um, it, was a, it was an easy read. Um, I really did enjoy it. It was kind of weird being stuck in Holden's head the whole time. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a different point of view than I think I've read in quite a while. And uh, so, and my, my background is not maybe as strong as yours and, and, and theology and or reading, but uh, no, I thought it was, I thought it was amazing. Uh, I, I can't believe I skipped it probably when I was on a reading uh, list back in high school. Um, but it's maybe one of those that I might run through again because it was an easy read and I uh, really enjoyed it. And the most of the time it gets skipped is actually because it gets censored. This is, I believe, the most censored book um, in all of the public school curriculum. Uh, there are more public schools that boycott this book than any other book. Um, I think it's pretty obvious even on the first couple pages, there's a lot of swearing. <laughs> uh, there's, there's controversy. Uh, there's some... Um, I guess at one point, you know, he, he hires a prostitute, doesn't go through with it. He, you know, it, it's very early on. It's very offensive. But I, I think the funny part is, is the same people that have a problem with his swearing and his, uh, his, I guess, teenage angst and just being edgy for the sake of trying to be edgy. It kind of missed the point of the book where it's like, yeah, those are, those are kind of, not great quality traits, you know, uh, to, to have. And I think that that's one of those that's, uh, I, I, I find that it's self-defeating for censorship. Uh, I mean, let's, before we dive right into the book, what are your feelings on it being censored or, or, you know, what do you think? Or about censorship in general. I actually can't hear you right now. I, I think I hear you now. You can hear me now. Okay. I hear you now. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Uh, censorship in general. Well, I think a lot of people take things too seriously, especially with Catcher in the Rye. I mean, I guess I can understand some parents are going to say, oh, I don't want my kids reading where he's swearing. or And I don't think it, I mean, it wasn't, I guess I'm maybe not, or desensitized a little bit to it. I don't think it was that bad. Um, but I guess I could get that where if you have adolescents, you don't want them to be corrupted by it. But I think people take it way too seriously. And I'm not quite sure because it, you know, I know that it had been censored and I, I thought like it was going to be worse. Like I was always waiting for some other turn to happen where, uh, I don't know, somebody get killed or, or something happened where he did something, um, and there, sorry for the noise. Oh, you're fine. You got a family. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I don't, I really don't understand why many books are ever uh, censored. I think, and you guys have brought this up uh, in the big show and the dailies. A lot of times if you censor something or um, make it so it's not accessible, people want it more. Yeah. So so it doesn't really make sense to me, but no, I kind of went off a little bit there. But. No, it's it. I, I asked you to go off on it. the the uh, The book was read famously by uh, the guy who shot John Lennon and uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre guy. Both 
had the book as like inspirations behind why they did what they did. Uh, I can't fathom where they get that from the book. I, no. I, I genuinely can't. There, like you said, there's not even death in it. Like there's no, there's no murder. You know, there's, I, I guess there's the, there's death that, of his brother that occurs before the book even happens with three right. years prior, um, which is touching. Uh, he's sentimental towards it, but it's certainly not a good feeling you get about it. So it's weird that somebody would kill John Lennon in the name of Holden Caulfield. <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's very bizarre. Uh, and, and I think that probably lends something to the censorship because, you know, there were famous killings and somebody's like, catch her in their eyes, why I did it. Yeah, um, well, everybody, you know, you can find any little thing. People have used the Bible, Quran, whatever. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, you can find some passage in a book and say, ooh, this speaks to me and it made me, kill all these people like no you're just a little tweaked in the head automatically so you find something um wherever you want to so yeah. you know i that's that's a good point i never thought of i never realized that history that the the texas chainsaw massacre and john lennon's murder mm -hmm. you just the rise there yeah and um jd salinger i mean became a hermit after the book he did he didn't uh didn't talk about it doesn't uh so uh, there's some points, um, uh, let's see, there's two bo books in the literature discourse, as far as I know, in, in the standard curriculum, back when the, the AP list was still going around. Um, there were two books where the meaning wasn't clear. And one of them was Catcher in the Rye, and the other was Hamlet. Uh, it, uh, and, those, and other than that, people kind of have clear meanings. Now, I think there's absolutely clear topics in Catcher in the Rye, if I might be so bold, I would definitely propose that there is a meaning that I feel like I know the meaning to Catcher in the Rye, and it's definitely not, not what the murderers seem to think it is. But right. uh, it doesn't help that the author kind of went silent afterwards, um, largely because of people, I, I think even, he even cited misinterpretation of his book for people just kind of wanted to make it theirs, and he mm. didn't want to deal with it. Right. Uh, which is really too bad because I think it's, it's one of the great, uh, it's one of the great books in, in American history for sure. So let's talk about the book. Uh, I, there's so much to talk about. Uh, I guess let's, let's talk about big moments in the book. What you thought was a very impactful moment um, or, 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 or section of the book. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think for me, I'm, I'm even going to start early in the book, mm -hmm. but I think it's very clear he's bugged by phoniness. Uh, that's definitely an ongoing uh, topic. The, uh, he, he, did, did, he pretty much thinks everybody's inauthentic except for him. Very close, except for um, what? Uh, and he's very protective of people that he, d he does think are are authentic or very innocent or young kids. Um, Jane Gallagher is somebody he considers uh, an authentic person. That's mm -hmm. why he's so mad when he, when his roommate may or may not have made out with her, you right. know, uh, and, and cause he hates his roommate, thinks he's inauthentic. And then um, his, his, uh, his little sister at the end uh, when, when she's right, having fun riding on the carousel. Um, I guess a big moment for me then is the end. Now, this is one of those endings where people uh, disagree on what happened. He doesn't say. Uh, it's generally assumed, and I agree with the literary consensus, I guess, that he went to a loony bin, that he had a mental breakdown. Mm -hmm. um, some people think he went to jail. Uh, he talks about how he, stood, how he sat on a bench in the rain for a long time after the carousel was like over and like just kind of, you know, uh, got lost in his own head for a bit, went home, something happened. And then he talks about, I can't wait till I get out of here next month. Right. Uh, now I, I'm talking about both the beginning and the end of the book as like my big moments. But I think the reason that's important is because this was a journey for Holden Caulfield. And mm -hmm. it starts with him getting kicked out of school. And you want this journey home, which is actually where he's supposed to be going, right? He's supposed to be going home, but it actually ends with him in the loony bin. And so I think for me, the reason that's such a big moment is it's used as a literary tactic to be like, this is a direction you think that's going to lead you home, the direction that Holden's on, and actually leads you to like utter madness. 
So I think for me, that framing element causes me to look at the whole story and just say, what, what happened? Like, you, you know, what, what was the problem with your trajectory that instead of something that should have taken you home, took you to a madhouse? And I think that's such a brilliant framing element. There's so many other things to talk about within it and the little stories that happen within that I, I'm sure we'll get to. But, but I think for me, that framing element is too brilliant to pass up on. Uh, how about you? Big, big moments, big sections. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I think that is a, a big aspect. Um, it, the big moments, I think, were some of the larger deaths in his past around him. I mean, his younger brother, I think, obviously, that he had a huge impact that he never really um, digested and, and moved on from. Obviously, he's in the book, he writes a, the, the, uh, the essay for his roommate, who later then punches him in the face. Um, uh, and that is about his little brother's baseball mitt and the details to it. He can still remember it, you know, in, in his head vividly in the poems. And then the other one that shocked me um, was the, and you see this because he sees like young adolescent, so young teenager, and the other kid that got, uh, that wasn't phony and called some kid out. And then they went to his room, and the four or five guys were giving it to him or whatever, and he ended up jumping out the window. Uh, and and died that way. And, um, I didn't see that coming, that one there specifically. And that kind of like, you, you kind of kept settling in of like, you know, how much, I guess, anger and um, like you can understand the depression that he had, obviously just kept feeding more and more. And they kept, the Salinger kept giving you little nuggets as to why that was there. Um, it didn't give it all up front. So I don't know if there's one or two big things, but I think, You'd, you'd mentioned the end. Um, I did think the end was nice of how it was his sister's. So he kind of had this thing with younger children. And I think it was almost transitioned into adulthood that you, it's innocence loss. Mm. And, um, you know, people become more and more phony as they get older. And his sister wanting to leave with them obviously shook him. And then also her still being a child and getting on the carousel and riding it twice. And that's where he's sitting there watching it in the rain and it didn't affect him because he was just, you know, happy uh, and not depressed at that moment. So I think that kind of settled it right at the end there, which was really kind of a big moment for me uh, on that. Um, and then I'm trying to think there, I don't know. There's a lot of really great, I mean, even for only having 220 pages, there's a lot of great little nuggets along the way. I mean, even he like, he's talking the whole time about like as if he's good with girls and it sounds like for a minute like oh he's had sex multiple times and then he then he's like well i have to admit i'm a virgin and then he tries to get a prostitute and you know the prostitute comes in and then he can't have sex with her so he he's like well, let me just talk to you and it, so there's a lot of moments that kind of strike you oh man uh, you br you brought up a million different things that mm -hmm. i would talk about forever the the mitt from his little brother uh who passed away that he, his little brother wrote poems on it, right? Yeah. So that uh, because while he was in, in the outfield, he didn't like paying attention to baseball. And so he liked reading the poems on the glove, right? And this is such a, there, there's so many great symbols in the book and that's one of them because Holden absolutely idolizes that glove. Uh, he goes back for it. That's one of the possessions. He's like, hey, I'm going back for the glove. When his, uh, what one of the roommates plays like keep away with it for like a split second, he like, gets very violent he's like no nobody not this glove is is huge in my life um obviously writes the essay about it and and he he i mean he's flunking out of school so it's like well why are you writing an essay and and so obviously whatever he writes is going to be very genuine and and he chooses to write about that glove um but he idolizes it and it's in and, and, and the symbol of that by saying here's something functional the glove it's supposed to be used for baseball well, I'm going to write poems all over it so that I'm like distracted. And Holden has very much embraced that distraction in his real life to say, well, he, you know, be, I think because of his love for his little brother, he sees something that he's supposed to be doing and he's just going to keep himself distracted with something else. Uh, it, it, it's sad because it's like, 
he feels, and I can see where he gets it, that anything else would be like crapping on the memory of his younger brother. But it's something that as a reader, you're like, dude, you got to move past this. You have mm-hmm. to engage in one conversation in your real life. Like you have to engage in a real conversation with somebody. Um, the very end, you talked about that. There, uh, he talks about the ring, how the kids reach for the ring. And for a moment, and this is kind of like rock climbing, you know, for a moment you can fall unless you make sure you have a good hold, you know, and, and uh, they talks about the ring that they have to reach for when they're climbing up on the horse on the merry-go-round and how he says, you have to let them reach, you know, at some point you can't help them. They right. have to reach. And I think that's really what causes his, I guess what I believe is a mental breakdown, you know, what, what causes his, his, him to go insane mm-hmm. uh, is that, he's like, Oh yeah, of course you got to let him reach at some point. Kids got to be able to reach and grab for the ring on their own. And I think that's when he has this, well, I think I'd say has the realization, except I think it's a mental breakdown because he can't handle the realization that eventually kids got to grow up, you know, Mm -hmm. like you gotta, you gotta grow up, you gotta move on. And he's in a place where he's absolutely unable to move on. Um, Let's see here. You brought up something else. I, I don't remember the, but, but um, yeah, th- those are just such powerful symbols and they are so, I, I think in all of American literature, those are some of the most powerful. I did want to, let me add one more symbol, I guess, while we're talking about symbol piles, the very beginning, his brother uh, DB uh, writes the uh, writes. Uh, he's a famous Hollywood writer now, which means he must be phony. Right. And it's sad because his brother clearly cares about him. His brother's the one picking him up from the loony bin. His brother visits him like at all the, writes him every day, visits him weekly. You know, he's, he's like the one person there for him. And he wrote a book that got famous, which Holden dismisses called The Secret Goldfish. And uh, Holden at the beginning gives us like a brief synopsis of it. He talks about how he, uh, it's about a kid who paid for a goldfish with his own money. So he doesn't want anybody else to see it. So he paints the tank so that nobody can see the goldfish, paints over the tank. This is a simple, Holden, this book is about Holden. And right. he, doesn't, he doesn't realize that his brother basically wrote a best-selling book about him. How ironic that Holden Caulfield gets two books, Catcher in the Rye and The Secret Goldfish about him, that he doesn't know are about him, you know? Uh, and uh, it's, you know, because here's the thing is, you, you think you're painting something else, somebody else out, right? right? He paints out uh, his teacher who cares about him at the beginning, who has the grip. Uh, very genuine person with him. Uh, I'll talk about that later because I'm, I'm yammering. But, the, but he paints uh, over something because he thinks he's keeping everybody else out. And what's he really doing? He's painting himself in. You know, right. when you paint over a goldfish tank, yeah, you punish other people from seeing the goldfish. You also punish the goldfish very substantially, right. right? The goldfish doesn't get to see out either. So it's kind of that two-way street. You think you're painting people out, but you're really painting yourself in, mm-hmm. you know? And this is, uh, I, I, that, I'm just going to throw that symbol onto the pile as well. Um, because I did not catch that the first time around. But now that you bring it up, it's like, wow, yeah, obviously makes complete sense um uh, on that end so thanks for bringing that up oh yeah i I, i'm uh this is this is this may be i think my third time reading the book i i love it it is uh yeah and i I love symbolism just as a device Mm -hmm. i uh i i think it's funny because kids uh when they're younger like hate symbolism but i think that's just because they're they're forced to write essays about it but i think as i get older i'm just like oh that is such a good symbol for what for what's going on and uh so maybe this is probably why this is one of my favorite books, since there's like one on every page. Uh, right. Again, at the beginning, he talks about everybody being phony because they're, he's there. So he's, it's a revolutionary uh, memorial, right? He's got the cannons, the old 1776 cannons uh, at the beginning of the football game. And he's like, oh, look at everybody here is phony. They're here to watch a football game. But what's he doing? He's checking out girls. It's like, well, yeah, like you're at a place where there's a very real thing that occurred. You're calling them phony and many of them are, you know, I don't want to dismiss every time Holden calls somebody phony because many of them are, but he's being disingenuous as well. You know what I mean? As well. Yeah, absolutely. And that's just, that's just another one of those. Anyhow. Um, I don't know. I asked the last question. What do you, what do you want to talk about? Oh boy. Um, well, it, it, I think I had mentioned prior to us coming on, did it have the same impact 
for you that you had to almost put the book down because it started giving you uh, actually physical anxiety reading from that first person um, and everything that Holden's going through. I mean, maybe because I jammed through so much of it at one point in time, you're kind of in, 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 you know, engaged in it. But I don't know if it had any physical uh, effects on you as well. I read through it in, a, in, in three days myself. It's, mm-hmm. it's so short. I think it's, it's too bad that more of the book club was like, oh, Catcher in the Rye, something my teacher made me to read. Maybe I won't read this one. But it's so short. And it really, for me, it comes across like reading a Twitter account, like I said earlier. It's, uh, it, it's very top of the mind sounding. It's funny that he's such a good writer, Salinger, is because he manages to cram like a symbol on every page on there right. because it really doesn't come off that way. Like he's just spouting, you know, he's just, and so I guess the read for me might've been a little bit easier, although maybe that's because I lack the empathy because I look at it through like a literary point of view. Um, Because it, it, I mean, if you want to talk about teenage angst, Mm -hmm. nobody's getting, nobody's touching Holden on this one. Uh, he, He has it in spades. You definitely, I think you learn, you feel so bad for him. And then at the same time, you're like, dude, but you don't see like what a jerk you're being sometimes. Like, you know, he'll accuse somebody else of doing something. And then, and so maybe, maybe I'm a little too judgmental towards Holden. Uh, and so maybe it was a little easier to read because I didn't, uh, I didn't, I didn't love him maybe as much as I should have. Of course I care about him and I feel bad for him, but, right. but, I, I think maybe I, I could have empathized a little bit better. I think for me, I look at his, I guess to answer your question, I think maybe not because I'm turned off by his whole calling everybody phony thing. And he, it's funny because he'll call everybody phony, but then he hates genuine interaction. And mm-hmm. that is so reoccurring throughout the book. His teacher at the beginning who has the grip and he's totally sick, could just stay at home and be sick. But what does he do? He actually wants to talk to Holden, sends a note, was like, hey, come see me. I want to talk to you. Tries to put his life on the right track and like wishes him good luck. And Holden's like, I hate this whole thing. This whole thing sucks. Like, I can't believe a teacher would do that. What a terrible thing to do to me. Right. Without realizing it's like, this might be one of the least phony people you've met in your life. And I mean, there's nothing less phony than that guy's sickness, right? He sees a lot of genuine interactions, like his runny nose. Or uh, him being there in a bathrobe because everything's too hot, right? And then he's like, oh, gross. I, wouldn't, I wish he wouldn't sit there in a bathrobe. I wish he wouldn't, you know, uh, pick his nose in front of me. Like, but those are genuine things. When you right. have, like, you either want one or the other. And mm-hmm. I think Holden doesn't realize at this point that he has to choose. He wants people to be genuine in their interactions with him. But he also doesn't want to see anybody pick his nose. Well, when you pick your nose you have something up there. That's a genuine, that's a very human thing to do, you know? And so when people act genuine with him, the, I mean, he's got that second teacher that, uh, that's one of the, I guess people don't un- quite understand what's going on in that book, whether the teacher, the second teacher is a pedophile. Yeah. That was kind of it. creepy. Right. He w- yeah. yeah. I mean, he wakes up and the teacher's patting his head. Right. And, uh, it's creepy but it's probably genuine. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like uh, I, I don't read into that as pedophilia. I think the teacher is going through some stuff himself and is, I think Holden is putting a lot of things on other people. And I think that teacher is in turn putting things onto Holden. Right. But, but I think, uh, I, I, I guess for me to answer your question, maybe I wasn't as anxious as I could have been because I was just saying, man, this, this guy has so many things to fix. I kind of wanted to be a part of his life because I wanted to be like a doctor or a psychologist to be like, dude, do you see what you're doing right now? Like you're, you're pushing away everybody who's genuine with you. And yet, and so of course you're surrounded by phonies because anybody who's had a real response with you, like, I mean, there's nothing more phony than paying a person uh, the prostitute, right? This is the whole motif of the prostitute. You pay a prostitute to have sex with you and then you expect her to wax poetic. Like, like you guys want to talk and he wants to have a real like relationship with this prostitute. Well, the whole thing is predicated on him giving her money for sex, right? right? Like, yeah. so it's never going to be genuine. It's not a genuine interaction. It was not, it was not founded on anything genuine. You know, no. the whole thing is meant to be artificial. The reason you hire a prostitute is to be artificial. And so he, he is struggling because he's like, eh, that wasn't a genuine interaction either. Well, of course it wasn't. You know, <laughs> you, you paid for a prostitute. Uh-huh. Um, anyhow, let, but 
let's talk about, why don't you go off for a bit about why, like the things that made you anxious and, and maybe your more empathetic approach. Yeah. And maybe you said this is your third time through. Maybe if I, another time or two through, I, you know, you get past that, but I, I almost felt bad. Like I understood, like he was a jerk at the, Absolutely. Um, but it was almost like you could feel like I just started feeling that angst that he had inside of him. And it was almost like he kept putting up this defensive shield by, you know, calling everybody else a phony and so on and so forth. And also trying not to have those, uh, those close relationships. And then I didn't know if it was so, you know, coming back that he still didn't digest the death of his younger brother because he was so close with him. So now he didn't want to get close to anybody else. And I guess the only other person was his younger sister, Phoebe. But um, he also just, I think, wanted to keep her a little child. Um, but, you know, it, I guess part of it is, I guess, you know, growing up, there was times that I had gone through and I had anxiety or other as aspects like that. So um, I guess that kind of brought me back to almost a, a teenage years at, at some times where you're trying, you're going from that childhood um, being naive per se. And as you go through adolescence and you're growing up, you start to see the world in different, different lens. And um, sometimes you don't like what you see. And maybe it's not what the world is, is how you're going to perceive it. Um, and you have to go through that. Mm -hmm. So part of it for me was just getting in there. And then it just seemed like just crap was happening. And I just saw him going down this this tunnel of like, you know, you, you got to get yourself together. And, and part of it was probably me waiting again for something really bad to happen. Nothing really bad happened. But it just seemed like it, it, he was going down that road of something really bad was um, going to happen. But uh, no, I, and I think he also did, he brought up the, the, this, this, the teacher, the, the second teacher at, towards the end that pat him on the head um, while he's sitting in the dark on the ground next to him. Uh, he had mentioned, and, and I don't know, again, like you, you kind of take everything that Holden says great fault because is it true or not? Because he also seems to be a pathological liar at times. Mm -hmm. uh, like tells people these stories, grand stories, and kind of go off, um, which will make me jump back to one of the parts that had me laughing for a little while. But with this teacher, um, he said it wasn't the first time that he felt like he was around a pervy situation or however he worded it. It's like it was happened 12, 14. So then I'm like, well, what other situations has he had with adults as a child that maybe makes him even more uh, pissed off at the world and grossed out by it um so that was that was kind of weird and then i i did love you 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 found out pretty soon pretty early on that the kid was pretty intelligent um when he got on the train and he's talking to the mother of one of the the kids that goes to the school and he like he's like laying it on thick i'm like wow man this kid is good and that's before you know you didn't even realize that he really hasn't ever hooked up with any girls at all um but he's, you know, offering her a light, a uh, cigarette, lights it for her, says we should go get a drink. Uh, and he just sounds suave, suave as hell for like a 15-year-old kid or whatever he was at that point in time. Yeah. So I thought that was, reading through that interaction for a couple of pages had me laughing a couple of times, some of the shit that was coming out of his mouth. But um, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, so that interaction particularly is one that um... – one that kind of reveals how like, like like you were talking about how how kind of phony he is well he'll turn into like rico suavo all of a sudden and, and be like so he's talking about how this girl was captured uh by what he had to say now she rejects him straight up and it's like oh yeah she just had to she gives him a fake excuse to get out of there mm -hmm. uh she's not interested in him the funny thing is is he thinks he's he says oh i got her in the palm of my hand because all you have to do is talk about how great people's kids are and right. they'll, they'll think you're amazing. And so he's like, oh, has he told you? And he makes up some stories about her kid since he goes to school with him. He hates the kid. Right, right. right. So he starts telling these fake stories. She immediately knows it's not true. And so she's turned off immediately. She's just like, right, whatever. You know, it's funny because at first she engages him. And then he's like, oh, let's, uh, you know. Yeah. And, and he, thinks he's, he, he thinks he's working his magic, right? He's like, oh, yeah, I've got, I'm telling her how great her kid is. Thing is, she knows her son better than he does obviously right. and so he she is painfully aware when he's lying he isn't aware that he's being caught in a lie and right. so he continues to go on 
And then till till and she's like, yeah. Anyhow, uh, I definitely have to go. And he's like, oh, you don't want to get drinks or something? She's like, yeah, I definitely don't want to get drinks. No. And he's like, oh yeah, well, obviously she was busy because she totally would have done me. And it's like, oh, bro, you weren't even close. You know, <laughs> like you were no. you were messing that up pretty bad. The um, he is a relatable character. Um, and the funny thing is, I th- I think in this chat, and I think in the book, he's gone through a few extreme things: the death of a brother maybe a pervy situation with an adult. Um, it's hard because this is one of those where because you're reading through his eyes, uh, the eyes of a chronic liar, he will even say, because it's, it's dealt like he's talking with you about it. And he's like, I don't really want to talk about that. So we're not going to talk about it. And, you know, and, and I was drunk at the time, so I kind of don't really remember, but I think I remember this. It's like, well, how much do I trust you then? Right. So you really want to know about his pervy situation with an adult. Was it pervy? Or is he projecting again? Right. It is so hard to know. You know, I think the pervy situation may have been before his brother died. So it might be like maybe he that lends some genuineness to it because it does seem like maybe something in in him broke after that. And so if that happened beforehand, then maybe maybe there's another thing that's stunting him that's holding him back, um, especially sexually. yeah, I, I, and and so I don't mean to sound like, and I don't I, I don't want to treat this as evangelism either. Like you shouldn't be sympathetic to him. He's a he's a literary device. Damn it, you know. Like I, I mean, it's written through his perspective for a good reason, and that's so that you relate. Because I think in many ways, yes, we know, will not all have brothers that die. We'll not all have stunted growths or pervy situations, mm-hmm. but we all will go through this journey right. from being a kid that's happy that's riding a carousel that's you know that's having fun a kid that is goofy and and maybe writes a write something on their baseball glove because they're forced to go to baseball and they, i think everybody's been de- doing that i didn't really become genuinely interested in sports until after i was 10 but my parents had been like forcing me to try since i was like five you know and when i was five it was not fun so i absolutely relate to the yeah i would uh, oh my gosh, l- write something on my glove to to think about instead of actually playing baseball. Absolutely. And so you go from this journey, we all go from this journey, from being these kids to being this adult. Now you talk about loss of innocence, and that is probably the biggest, even more than the phony thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, much to my reluctance, because the phony is the, my favorite thing to discuss. But that's probably the biggest theme of the book, is this going from childhood to adulthood. And Holden, of course, is stuck in between his name. He hold, he's held, right? He he can't progress. He's stunted, and so he is want to, you know, and he thinks he wants to, but then he gets into a time where he could have sex, and he elects to hold hands. This is this isn't even the prostitute. This is uh this is like what that uh, early girlfriend girl. I guess not even girlfriend. That date he goes on, right? Mm-hmm. He loves her. They're totally into each other. He has a moment and he uses it to hold hands and he's like, oh, I'm so glad we did that because I totally would have ruined every, like it would have wrecked it if we had sex. Whereas I think an adult is like, well, that could be like the completion of your relationship. That, that could be like the next step. You know, I, I, I'm not trying to project like immorality, but I think it's clear that moral, do, uh, that Holden doesn't even care about, uh, I mean, he calls himself an atheist. He doesn't care, you know? So you would say, well, if that, you don't have that, that if you don't have Christianity holding you back, then go ahead and take the next point in your relationship. But it's clear that he doesn't want that. He only wants sex from somebody he doesn't care about or some, you know what I mean? If it's somebody that he loves and he thinks is authentic, he thinks having sex would ruin it. Right. He'll mess, so it, he's, up. He'll mess it all up. Right. And I think there's at some point, and we can call it loss of innocence. I really love the symbol of like reaching for the, for the ring. For me, I, I man, Maybe this is, you know what, let's talk about this next. I have a tough time talking about loss of innocence anytime. Because I think for me, I I can't point to a time in my life where I'm like, this is where it all wrecked. I think it is a slow process. Mm -hmm. I think there's many things that lead to it. And I'm not sure if you ever really, and I'm not trying to get like Catholic here, but I, 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 you know, where I'm saying like, you know, we're born sinners are born pure or, or you know whatever it is i'm just not sure you ever really have it i think you just encounter you you are born not knowing anything you have a series of realizations i think sometimes people 
tell you that everything's good. But I think if you teach a child from the age they can talk that bad stuff happens, I think loss of innocence kind of happens right there. You know what I mean? Like I, I get that sometimes that we teach our kids about Santa Claus and you grow up and find out that Santa Claus isn't real. But I, I, I just don't see that as much different from losing other innocence where you're like, I thought the world was great versus parents that are like from the beginning are like, yeah, there's, there's no Santa Claus. You know what I mean? Like, I just don't, I think for me, it's just a process of realization. And so I have a tough time talking about loss of innocence. I, cause, and maybe it's just because I haven't gone on that journey myself. I mean, I, I absolutely have grown up. I've had more realizations but I think people would, uh, especially people my age, they talk about like, oh, September 11th just opened everything for me. And I'm just like, I don't know, like it, it is a cataclysmic evil on the, on the par of which I hadn't seen before, but I guess I always knew it could happen. So, mm. you know, I mean, it's, I mean, one, I've seen one plane crash before. So the fact that four hijackers did it on the same day, it's a bad day. But I don't know if it's like, this is my loss of innocence. This is where I realize it's, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts on loss of innocence? And, and you, I mean, you can use the book as a backdrop if you want, but I just, I, I have a tough time talking about it. Right. I think um, uh, loss of, so with loss of innocence, I don't think, I mean, you can't, maybe one event can kind of push you to an extent. Yeah. Um, but I think it's a slow transition. And, I, and maybe with specifically this book, um, he couldn't get over it. Um, or some people can't, like they can't go from childhood into adulthood and, and make that leap. Or maybe, you know, because you, you see some kids that are like, and I've known them, you probably know them 13, 14, 15 years old. I mean, they got their shit together. They know what they're doing. They know where we're going. And I'm like, I don't know. I'm just trying to see what people are doing later on to hang out. Um, so it, it, it all it's all different but i think it's a it's a long change because i think when a kid yeah you can you can understand death you understand birth you understand bad things happen um but i think when you start becoming more and more aware of the larger world around you um and how much you don't have control of things maybe that's where there's that kind of growing up of maturation of wow you know and maybe some people will never get this, but you're not really in control. I mean, you, you have some control of your life. You can determine what you want to do and where you want to go. Um, but there's a lot of events that you have no control over. And you just have to understand that, hey, basically life is pure chaos. And either you're going to flow with it or you're not. Um, and I, I've already brought that up with Peterson and Taoism and so on and so forth. But um, it, it really is. And you've just got to come to grips with there's so much in my life even the people that I love that could be gone tomorrow yeah. and you know, either I'm going to be okay with this and try to live every day as if it might be my last or try to hold on to this, this fate, this feeling that um, that won't happen and, and everything will be good and rosy. Um, but I think with, with innocence, you know, things, I guess it's an interesting phrase to use, but even as you come through as a kid, you know, you don't know. I mean, we brought up the sexual inter interactions with Holden and other people like that. As a child, you don't get that. You don't understand it because it's not like you don't have those hormones running through you yet. And then you start to age and you start having the hormones and you start liking, you know, other people more than just as friends. And you start going through that and then somebody that you like uh, hurts you somehow. And then so that's kind of, okay, maybe that's a little loss of innocence there. Or, okay, somebody that you thought cared for you maybe doesn't and okay well that's eye-opening and it's i think it's a long transition of your loss of innocence but maybe innocence is as your infant child you have complete innocence because you know no better so you're just learning as you go and as you go through life you're losing that more and more um although that can kind of go down another path but i guess those are my some of my thoughts on loss of innocence innocence I could I couldn't have hoped for a better commentary on that because I think that does that does help me a lot because uh, I think sexuality does have something to do with it uh, you know when when you start saying oh I want more than just play time with this person I think for me and like you said like you either say you're okay with it or you're not maybe it's just the fact that I'm okay with it like I don't uh, I think maybe too okay with it I don't have hold and struggle at all and maybe mm -hmm. that also helps for my like why I'm not empathetic towards him 
that probably is like why I, I shouldn't say helps, but that probably damages my, my ability to relate to him because I'm just like, who cares? Yeah. You grow up, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, and maybe it helps. I mean, I, I don't have, um, I don't have kids of my own. My girlfriend's got a couple kids and I treat them like mine, but they were a little bit older when we started dating. So, you know, like, I, I don't know. It's, it's, a. Uh, it's hard to say. Maybe I'd feel differently if I had a kid and I just want to preserve. I know that I've, I've, I've heard a lot of ex- parents express that they wish they could, could have kept their kid at a certain age for forever. Mm-hmm. For me, I'm like, I've always been excited when, when the kids, when Kai or Riley, like do something new or progress or realize something for the first time. It was really cool when I was able, I talked with Riley about, pol- like he finally cared about politics for the first time when the European Union, <laughs> when they banned memes. Uh, yeah. and, and he and actually, like, yes. yeah. And, and he's like, yeah, dude, that's lame. And I'm just like, yes, it's so lame. Like, I want to have you on the show, you know, <laughs> like, let's talk about how banning means <laughs> a bad idea because he has like, so he's a, he's a gamer, right? He plays some video games and he has friends that are over there and they're talking about how it's impacted them and like how they like, yeah, I can't, I can't display this anymore. I, you know, I, I, and at the moment they're not like mass incarcerating, they're just deleting and, and, you know, it, it's, wow. it's or whatever, but they're talking about how, like, the content, uh, you know, and they're like, yeah, we can't do memes anymore, so they get, they get deleted, they get taken down, or you get in a lot of trouble for reviewing them, and they are able to do more if they want to, you know, they could throw me in jail for intellectual property theft, and stu- And I was just like, oh, right, we can talk about, okay, I'm going down a rabbit hole, but either way, I love talking about him like that with him for the first time, and so I didn't have that, like, oh, no, my little guy knows politics, like I was just like yeah like that's cool like I want to talk about that Mm -hmm. and so maybe I'm just too okay with it like I have the opposite of Holden's problem versus he's got like a serious problem with it um here I'll 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 turn the question back on you though is um now you're an adult so you look and I think that's where as an adult we always have to try to remember what was it like as a kid so I don't know if there's any of that moment of like, as you, as you can hear mine yelling up there right now, <laughs> any moments of time where it, it was different. I mean, I look back now and it's like, yeah, grow up, come on, get over it. Everything will be fine. Um, you know, even let's say your first girlfriend or boyfriend or somebody like that first time you get broken up, it's like the world is crumbling upon you as like a 12 or 13 or year old or however old you are. Cause it's the first time your heart's broken. Well, now you're like, get over it. You know, like, it's going to, there's going to be plenty more to come from this and you'll learn, you'll, you'll move on. And the longer, you know, it's like any wound, the longer you, you let it heal, it's, it's going to heal itself. Um, so did you have, I mean, maybe you didn't, did, there are no empathetic times uh, through teenage years or anything that like uh, you that was, oh, wow, this is different. I guess it got me there because my initial response was like, no, like, you know, just casually thinking about it because I think for me, like, they're like, oh, and it turns to wanting sex from somebody before you wanted nothing from somebody. I'm like, well, even babies want something from everybody. And Mm -hmm. even when you're a little kid, yeah, it's not sex, but you want your play partner to make you happy. And, and so for me, I think that usury attitude, you just add hormones to it and becomes a different thing that you're trying to use them for, you know? And so, Mm -hmm. and so my initial response was thinking, no, but there are several I guess for me, it's manifest in the form of dreams that not, not like visions, but like dreams that I had, uh, goals, things that I wanted to do that I never did and will now never get a chance to do because I'm not in that state anymore. I, I remember Mount, you know, climbing mountains with my family. I have climbed all but three of Colorado's 14,000 foot peaks. We were big big mountain climbing family the only three that i haven't climbed you actually have to have gear to climb and i just we were none of us were bringing up like you know pythons and and hammers and and ropes and whatever but you know i climbed the rest of them and i remember being a pain in the butt about it and i always wish that i could you know because i'm like "Eh, of course you're a kid you'd rather stay at home play video games for me my obsession was baseball i just wanted to play baseball and 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 go to the batting cage and hit all the time and uh I'm not, I wasn't able to, I can't get that back. Like not only like literally, even though my attitude has improved now that I'm an adult, I regret that being a pain in the butt and being like, do I have to, I don't want to climb. And 
I miss that time with my family and it'll never happen because my mom, and my dad got divorced. The two brothers that I had in climbing with it, they've got kids now. Mm-hmm. They got a family. It's too busy. And so there really are times like that that are like, you need to enjoy this while you're young because it's not going to happen when you're older. Right. So I guess maybe uh, it's fun. Oh, man, powerful that you asked that because it does make me think that maybe there is more to this than just, you know, wanting sex all of a sudden. Right. You know? Yeah. There's many different la- layers and layers on that. Um, yeah. Across, across the way. Yeah. I, I remember. So I went on this uh, canoeing trip and I just had so much fun and it was with the boy scouts. So only my dad could go and my brother and, and, but it was so much fun. I just remember being like, man, I can't wait till we grow up and we're all just going to get together and do this all the time without realizing that you are never going to do this again. You know, there's no chance. I, I, I had, I always had a vision. I'm very close with my, my, I had two brothers that I was raised with and then my mom remarried and actually have, I have a, I got a third brother out of that, Sean, who I am very close to like a brother now, you know? And so, so it's not all bad, you know, I gained a brother in that sense, but I just really, I'm very close with them. But I always thought when I was growing up, I was like, Oh, you know what we're going to do? We're going to break the tradition. We're going to be the ones that we all decide to, to get a big house together and we'll all get together and we'll all eat breakfast together and we'll all have dinners together and we'll watch TV together. And, and yeah, we'll go to our separate jobs. Maybe but we all come back to the same house and what a goofy dream that is now, but I won't lie. I still want it. Yeah. You know, like if, if I were to have the opportunity, if my brothers were to be like, Hey, we've all decided to go in on a house. I would, I would sell everything. I'd move to wherever it was in an instant. Like, and so, yeah, it might seem like some pipe dream, you know, like, and, and it's goofy. Like, you know what I mean? It would be a weird way to live life for everybody else. My two brothers do not want that. You know what I mean? They've, they've got their kids and, the, and their wives and they're happy with being like, yeah, we're going to, we're our own family. And I like having my, I, my own house for this unit. Right. And so I guess there is a part of me then that does have that idealism. They don't want this but I still do that holds on to that. Now I've let it go, Mm -hmm. but I guess that doesn't make me much better than Holden. He's just not able to let it go. And he's had some traumatic experiences that make it. So I just have, I guess I haven't had those traumatic experiences and I've been able to grow up, but yeah, I think that's the thing of becoming an adult is you realizing that certain things, you know, children are very uh, self-centered. Well, humans are very (laughs) self-centered. Let's put it that way. Oh yeah as you get older you realize that you can't have everything you want so it's it's i think that's part of it too is like you're trying to hold on to everything uh, and make everything perfect and then the world's changing around you and you're getting older and you can't you don't have as much control and hey you know what maybe yeah like your brothers don't want to live with you anymore well um that's something you got to deal with or um you know yeah you mentioned that canoe trip geez before the last i used to go to camp up in canada and um, we used to do canoe trips, loved them. Um, and I keep saying the last eight, ten, eight, ten, eight, ten years, oh, I need to go on a canoe trip. Even if it's a two to three night, you know, type of canoe trip up in Algonquin, that would be, that would be great. And I haven't gone. Um, and oh I probably gosh. haven't. Uh, and I, I, dude, like such a parallel. This canoeing trip was in Canada. It was Boundary Waters. And it was the, I just, I have always wanted to go back. And, yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's amazing, you know. Especially if you get way out and there's like, sometimes you go and like, there'll be, you'll see maybe a handful of other people, you know, every day. Uh, and then you're on a campsite, maybe on a, a lake with two or three campsites and nobody else is there, um, which is great. You know, you're out in the middle of nowhere, but um, um, I guess those things are a little bit easier, especially when you're a kid and you've got summers off, those, those things happen a little bit easier now that you're, you know, you got to work yeah. 50 out of the year almost. But uh, I mean, that's where I guess, yeah, he's, he's not allowing, to, he's not allowing things, things that change around him, he doesn't want to change with it and let it happen. Um, so I guess that was where it brought back that teenage angst of like, okay, you're growing up and things are changing. How are you going to deal with this? Yeah. Well, I've always considered myself more robotic. I think talk about this now, I kind of realize I'm not as robotic as I think, you know, chipping away. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that was there somewhere down in all, all that. I guess I just, yeah, really the only difference is I coped with it better. Mm-hmm. Well, I know we're, we're, we're over that hour mark here. So let's, uh, 
let's, I, I guess to wrap up, is there anything from anything that you think we missed? I think there's a million things that I could talk about in this book that I know we missed, but anything that you wanted to make sure that we got to? Uh, no, I, mean, I think we covered a lot. I mean, there's a lot of, I would say, I mean, anybody that hasn't read this, read this book. It's, it's one of those that I've always heard and always been in the background and, you know, okay, maybe one day I'll read it. And um, we named our son Holden and somebody said, Oh, like after catching the rye, I'm like, Nope, never read it. So I have no idea. I'm like, and a couple people asked me that. I'm like, all right, I got to find out who this Holden character is. So at least I know like um, from there, but I think it was a quick read. Um, every page you keep turning and there's something new. Hmm. And um, it, it, he does, JD Salander does, um, a great job of getting you in the head of this kid and you will probably love and hate him at the same time um, throughout the book. Uh, and, and also you want to reach through the pages and just kind of shake him and say, come on, man, wake up, um, get over this. Cause you can see especially the way he talks and, uh, and looks at everything. You're like, you're so intelligent. You've got a leg up on so many people, but you just can't get out of your own damn way. Um, I mean, we've all felt that way at times as well. So you can kind of bring that back of like, you can't get out of your own way. Um, and sometimes that's what needs to happen. So no, I, nothing specific, but a great read, loved it. And, um, ne next time I won't wait until like the week before to try to read the finalize the book. <laughs> yeah, but it's cool. It's fresh. Like I, I actually don't disapprove of that method when you're going to discuss it, like to be, especially with a book this short, it's not, I mean, if you procrastinate to the point where you're like, well, I'm not going to be able to read it. That's a problem. But if you're like, right. well, it's all fresh in my brain now. Mm -hmm. I know there's a few times like with Liberty's first crisis, I read it uh, immediately. And then you guys bring up something and I'll be like, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like I totally would have forgot. And it's funny what a difference a month makes, but yeah, it's uh, you know, for me, th there's one more symbol that I kind of want to end on and that's the hat. Uh, how mm -hmm. he buys this goofy hat that he likes wearing, but he wears it differently depending on the circumstances that he's in. Sometimes he, he, he's, he talks about it, it's a goofy hunter hat. It's the one with the big ear flaps and like the, the brim. Yep. And he's like, he bought it. And it's funny because you think, oh, this is a moment of spontaneity. Like this is actually him being like genuine for once. But the thing is he wears it differently depending on like the social situation that he's in. And it really just goes to show how he doesn't fit in because n no matter what, when you're wearing that hat, you're just not going to fit in. Like <laughs> you're, not, you're aiming to not fit in when you wear a big goofy hat, asked Dan Berman, you know, uh, when you, <laughs> the, uh, the, the, that, so like, this is just kind of something that you do. And it's really a motif that he doesn't ever say it, but he just says, it, it really screams, keep away. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to, I don't want to engage, you know? And so it really is just like people repellent, right? To wear this, to wear this big goofy hat. And he doesn't, I think he doesn't know that. I think something deep within his brain knows that, but I don't think he's consciously aware of it. I think it's a subconscious thing that he's doing. Yeah. And it happens throughout the whole book. But the thing is, he wears the hat differently and thinks he's being genuine. But the whole time, everybody wears different hats. And I think that there's something to be said that says that's not you not being genuine. That's just you understanding the reading the room, understanding the situation and saying, yeah, we all wear, we all wear different hats, you know, and, and, and right now it's appropriate for me to act this way. Uh, he talked about a preacher at one point in the book and he's like, this guy was just so phony and talking about his relationship with God. And the pre the preacher was a very real sounding person talked about his mistakes, talked about, good and bad stuff talked to and just talked about his relationship with God the whole time. And the preacher would wear a hat essentially to say like, yes, now I'm speaking to a group of colleagues. So this would be an appropriate an inappropriate time to talk about my pitfalls. And really to just say, it makes you question, is it inauthentic to just be the same person in every social situation? Or do you just get good at reading the room and saying, this is how my personality works in this situation. And I think that I would just, I really want to encourage <laughs> Holden in that direction to just say like, it's not that these people are being disingenuous. You're just, you're at a rally. And I think that there's something that says like, like, is it maybe, 
it is not disingenuous to try and I think this is where it touches me specifically because I am a unifier and I am a peacemaker. And so people be like, Oh, what? So you like, you just shut up about your anarchy libertarianism, you know, as soon as like your big statist aunt is in the room. And I'm like, well, yeah, I don't go as hard on it because I want her to feel comfortable with me. And I want to be able to talk about it without being all up in her face about it. Right. You know, and so with me, my, you know, my, my status aunt, I'm not going to be like, oh, you statist. And it's like, what? So, you know, and, and some people would say I'm inauthentic because I do that. But that's not it at all. I'm just using tact. And I think tact can be a genuine thing to do. You know, it can be a very authentic thing. I am a very tactful person. I don't like to hurt people. It's not right. because I'm inauthentic as soon as it comes to hurting somebody, it's just the authentic part of me doesn't want to hurt other people's feelings. You know, I don't. And, and so it's, it's, I think that that is the part for me where I just feel the worst for him that he just can't grapple with that. And, and he thinks that people have changed when really they're just, they just reveal who they are differently in a different circumstance. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, impro- uh, it's I, I guess for me, the reason I want to close on that is because it's like, yeah, we might all wear different hats on different situations, but that doesn't mean you're not genuine. It's the same hat. You just wear it differently. You know, I am still a libertarian with my status stance in the room. I just butter it up differently. I just pitch it differently. You know, I guess is maybe the best way I'll say it. I just am, am very, I work on her differently than anybody else. Now, my status stand is totally hypothetical. Everybody in my family and extended family at this point has got the liberty bug. But it's because I, well, I've got, I've got one that's still registered Republican but votes Libertarian. She just likes to vote in the primaries. And another who is Democrat, Democrat for life. I haven't reached her yet. Forget about her. Everybody else in my extended family has caught the bug. And the reason is because, it's not because I'm disingenuous with them. It's just because I... Talk to them where they're at, you know, and I think We're Libertarians is good at doing that. And I think that that's something that we should encourage. I guess the reason I want to leave on that is because that's a good takeaway from the book is to just be, it is not being phony to to be a nice person to people, uh, to to care about them. Now, uh, let's uh, let's talk about the next book, man. It's you and I, you know, for all I know, it might just be you and I, but uh, what what other books you got in mind? No, I did not come prepared for that, Hody. So if you've got a couple, why don't you throw them out there and I'll look at the uh, the list here. All right, let's see here. Let's see here. Okay. And I do like what you were just saying there about you can't come at somebody with a bullhorn. I mean, that's just, that is almost like a hold-in tactic, I would say. Of, um this is the way I believe. So I'm telling you and I'm telling you the way that I want to tell you. Right. And push people away. Right. And I think, I mean, he doesn't want people messing with his brothers, with his kid brother's glove. Well, yeah, of course. I think everybody relates to holding on that, you know, but to just like be like, I'm going to wildly punch you and I'm not going to talk about it. It's like, I think he could very easily be like, Hey, I had a little brother that died. That's his glove. Can you just please not mess with it? Uh, he even talks about it at the end after the loony bin, even hating him the whole time. He's like, you know, I really missed Ackley and Statler, like his roommates. You know what I mean? Like, even though he got in a physical fist fight with them, you know what I mean? He kind of like, I, I mean, I, I hope that at the end it's like the ice breaking a little bit to being like, I, I miss, he doesn't understand why he misses them. Right. But that he does miss them, you know, to be like, I, I really... Like, and to, cause to understand that they weren't bad guys when they would play keep away with his glove, with the glove, they didn't know what they were doing, but right. he also didn't explain to them what they were doing. He was just like, I'm going to punch you in the face if you do that. Well, that's not going to make college goof off stop. You know what I mean? No. So that's an, an effective means of trying to make them stop. Um, all right. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about genres. I mean, w- w- what are you feeling these days? Uh, we got... We just, we just finished a book on capitalism and politics last month. And so I could talk about economy and politics all day, but we should probably steer away from that. We just talked about an American classic. That was our first time, but I re- I'm, I'm glad we did it, man. It makes me want to do yeah. more. But just talk about classics. The, uh, 
we kind of did a Mount Rushmore already in the Libertarian Mind, as well as the Road to Serfdom. Um, I do want to get to Slaughterhouse Five, but that's a classic, as well as uh, written by somebody who is who is uh, uh, politically minded like us. But maybe we should save that. I don't know. We could do self help. We kind of started off with there. We haven't gone back to there for a while. If you want to talk about like self improvement. Um, yeah, I'm good with that. Um, you know, I've been listening to some Aaron Dales and also just some uh, John Maxwell leadership podcast stuff. And it's something to kind of get my mind um, focused again. Um, so I'm good with that. If there's something I'm trying to scan through these books here, there's so many on this. Yeah. I'm, I'm looking at them as well. Well, tell you what, maybe um, we can even, talk about it just in the book club and off the air i don't want necessarily yeah. everybody listening to us be like well in fact i can end this and we can still talk about it but just find it later but we'll uh join us the we're libertarians book club if you're listening to this it means you're a patreon donor we appreciate that uh so yeah follow us on the book club we're on goodreads that's how we do all our business and you can be a part of these uh Patreon or no, if you read the books or even if you feel like talking about whatever the subject matter of the book is, I've always been surprised at how people that didn't read the book still lend some value to the conversation. In this case, I Hadley, I'm glad it was just you and me because I had a lot to say. And uh, man, you got me, you got me feeling again. You made me feel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I made some uh, impact here. <laughs> yeah. But let's uh, let's let, let me go ahead and end this uh, end, end this video, and we'll we'll talk about it afterwards. But again, thank you so much, Hadley. Good talking to you again. Good talking to you, Hody. Have a good one. Bye.